Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Marketify. I'm your co-host, Joel Alconin. Dennis Dick is staying on to interview a very special guest, and that's Felix Salmon. He's senior editor at Fusion and author of the Felix Salmon blog. Felix, how are you doing this morning? I'm great, thanks. Well, thanks for coming on the show, and I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with that, with you and your writing, but could you just give us a, a little bit of your background and uh, what made you decide to start your own blog? <laughs> um, I, I was just excited. Everyone was doing it on, on in my little corner of the Lower East Side in 2003, so I thought I ought to do it as well because I'm a sheep and a follower. Um, but yeah, no, I, I actually started my own blog a little bit earlier than that, around 2000, just because it, I, I reckoned, I thought that was the point of the internet. I thought that was the, the whole point of the internet was that you would read and write. And then it turned into much more of a reading and much less of a writing thing. But, um, but back in like 99, 2000, I hadn't realized where it was going. So I thought everyone was meant to have their own blog. Um, and, then, um, and then once I started, I just kind of got hooked and never stopped. Felix, I wanted to ask you, I know yeah. you've said you've given some comments on Michael Lewis's Flash Boys back there in April when it came out, and you were saying that the book's flawed. Can you just go into, you know, why the book is potentially flawed? So, yeah, the I mean, Michael Lewis is is one of my favorite writers. He's kind of he is the best um writer of of non-fiction financial journalism in the world. I mean, there's, there's really no doubt about that. So, to get that out of the way first. The, my beef with Flash Boys was that he um, took this issue of high-frequency trading, which is an important issue, and I'm no fan of high-frequency high trading or high-frequency traders. I think that what they do is create a really big and important systemic risk in the market, that you have a huge amount of complexity in the market, and complex systems fail in catastrophic and unexpected ways. And that's a very bad thing. But instead of concentrating on that aspect of things, which he kind of just glosses over very quickly, instead he says that mom and pop retail investors are being ripped off and they're losing money um, as a result of high frequency trading, which is just not true. Um, mom and pop retail investors, if you're a small individual investor, you are the one clear beneficiary of high frequency trading. Um, you know, your, your orders are filled immediately at national best bid or offer. Um, everything happens incredibly cheaply. And, you, you know, you are unbelievably happy you've never had it so good. Um, very large institutional investors get hurt by this. And in a way, the high-frequency traders themselves um, are not making that much money anymore because the exchanges have worked out how to extract rents from them. But as the main thesis of the book, that like there's some, you know, something which ordinary individual investors ought to be worried about here in terms of getting ripped off, I just don't buy it. So you make a good point, though, here, just on the whole systemic p risk potential. I mean, we saw what happened when Knight's high-frequency uh, algorithm there what kind of went haywire back in 2012, and they ended up uh, buying and, you know, almost uh, bankrupting the firm. It was a real mess. So you can see, you know, algorithms work great, but when they go haywire, and I've had some algorithms as myself because I'm a prop trader and I've used some, and if they go haywire, they can lose a lot of money in a hurry. Um, so you make a good point with that. Is that where you see uh, just a major concern here then? And so all this other stuff that he was talking about mm, in the flash board? Yes and no. I mean, okay. you, the, the, what, what we saw with Knight was absolute, well, you know, it was actually an, uh, an algorithm doing what it was meant to do, but just sort of programmed badly and wound up, you know, and, and wound up getting picked off very quickly by, by other algorithms. All, all of high-frequency high trading has become this kind of spy versus spy game mm. where, um, you know, algorithms try and beat each other. And the way that Knight, you know, reacted to a certain change in market structure was really stupid and they wound up getting picked off and losing money and in a way that's what ought to happen in an efficient market is that the you know smart traders make money and the stupid traders lose money so i'm not too worried about that um 
I'm more worried about things like what we saw during the flash crash a couple of years ago, where the algos all do things which make sense on an individual level, but which collectively cause complete chaos in the market. Let's switch the script here a little bit. You wrote an interesting blog there a couple of days ago talking about stock buybacks there and um, how shareholders potentially might not be getting all of this money that is being spent on stock buybacks. Can you just talk about your, uh, your post there? So the, the, what, one of the things I wanted to point out, there's, this, there's a, a lot of debate about stock buybacks right now, um, especially, as, especially in, in, in the case of IBM. They seem to have sort of reached the limit of their... Um, utility. Uh, and again, I'm not religious on whether they're a good or a bad thing, but the one thing I wanted to point out is that stock buybacks don't just to shareholders. That some very large proportion of the money that is spent on stock buybacks, and in, in some cases like Cisco during the dot-com bubble, it was basically 100%, that that money um, is it's just making up for the options and the restricted stock which is being doled out to senior executives. So really what you're seeing here is a kind of hidden form of executive pay, mm. um, at least to some extent, rather than just simply a way of returning, returning money to shareholders. Yeah, because in the post you were given that IBM example, and we know the performance of IBM has not been great in the last few years, and you were showing how they had bought back 73 million shares, but actually the outstanding shares have only went down by 50 million because they've created so many new shares. And all companies do this, especially tech companies. There's a culture in Silicon Valley of, of paying people in equity. And, you know, in principle, again, you know, it's fine to pay people in equity, but um, you just need to be you, you need to be quite transparent about what you're doing, and a lot of these companies are not. And, sh and, and looking at the share count very carefully is something which shareholders are really quite bad at, and they kind of have faith in stock buyback programs, and the buy and, and the companies make a big song and dance about how much stock they're buying back, and they make much less of a song and dance about how much stock they're issuing. Felix, uh, shifting gears here a little bit to some of your writings back in 2007, 2008, um, you argued that the uh, CDO market could suffer a crisis and, uh, you know, be a result of subprime mortgage uh, defaults. I mean, that kind of came to fruition. There was something, you know, a little bit, you know, looking into the future. Do you see anything now that we're winding down QE and, and whatnot? Uh, do you see any kind of looming crises um, that may disrupt this wonderful bull market? <laughs> um, well, first of all, th thank you for, for telling me that I was incredibly prescient about CDOs. This is entirely untrue. I wasn't. Um, I, I actually had a surprising amount of faith in the ratings agencies and in CDOs. Um, I... Do um, what well, I mean. I think this bull market is, as you say, it, it's it's fueled in large part by QE, and so if QE um, is no longer, then we don't have the fuel anymore, which is which has been propelling stock prices upwards, and the global economy isn't looking like it's strong enough to you know, continue that upward momentum. You know, we have Japan falling back into recession. We have Europe looking sluggish. Um, so, and, and, and we have a, a pretty rosy sort of best case economic scenario priced into asset prices generally. Um, if you consider that to be a sort of, uh, you know, rational pricing of securities as opposed to just a hell oh no i've got lots of money i need to put it somewhere i have to put it in the market you know even if the market's expensive which i think is a large part of what's going on here um so um so yeah i think we have all of the preconditions for uh you know for, for prices to fall because it's not clear where the new money is going to come from in order to keep them rising We've had a couple people arguing here. Just Nick was just on the show, Nick Shaheen, and he was arguing how we don't trade off numbers anymore. We don't seem to move off of fundamentals. We just seem to move off of headlines. 
Um, are you noticing the same thing in the markets? Because I know it's the same thing as a trader. It seems like the headline comes out, we have an initial move where we spike quickly, and then we kind of just hang out. And for the most of the day, we kind of just sit there in a smaller trading range. Um, are you noticing that? And is that a concern? Um, well, this is actually related to the high frequency trading debate. The, what you've seen along with the rise of high frequency trading is a massive um, concentration of trading activity in basically the first and last five minutes of the trading day, mm. and that uh, nothing much happens in between. And uh, you know, there's a bunch of high frequency trading firms where they just basically go to lunch and take sort of three hour lunches in the middle of the day because they have no interest in what's going on during the middle of the day. Um, that's that's absolutely true. Um, I don't honestly think that there was some you know great golden era of the past where people were spending their days doing huge amounts of fundamental analysis, and this was reflected in stock moves at 2 p.m. or something. Um, but certainly, if you look at the volume-weighted activity in the stock market, it has become unbelievably barbelled, and it's all at either 9 a.m. or 4 p.m. Felix, you like to uh, like to rely on statistics uh, to understand the markets and whatnot. Um, without giving away your secret sauce, so, you know, what are <laughs> what are no what, secrets? I promise you. What are, what are some of the statistics? You know, this kind of goes along the line of what we were talking about. Have you created your own own group of uh, statistical indicators, or are there some standard ones that you like to follow? Oh God, no, no, no! I mean, statistics is is a technique. It's not. Um, it's not uh, an, a, an indicator-based thing, um, and frankly, I mean, since you know, I mean, everyone had their fa favorite indicators sort of during the financial crisis. You know, do you remember when we would all look up the TED spread in the morning to see where that was? <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, no, I, 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 I'm not someone who has like pet indicators. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not the kind of person who's like, well, you know what really matters is the Baltic Dry Index, and all you need to do is look at that, and you'll get, and they'll tell you everything you need to know. Um, what I do do is I just basically take a sort of Bayesian approach to new information. That, you know, that I I try and be quite rigorous in terms of knowing what my priors are, and then evaluating new information in the light of the priors and. And, and having a certain amount of skepticism, um, the slogan, of course, is, is that you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So the more surprising um, any individual data point, the less weight I'm going to put in it, you know, because I, un unless I'm absolutely certain that it's true. So, for instance, I mean, one, one thing we can look at um, is, is all of the headlines about Japan going back into recession, which, you know, technically is true. We have that print, but it's also true that that print is going to get revised and Japan might not be in recession. We don't know. You know, you, you can't say that we have 100% um, certainty about that kind of thing. So you just want to look at things in a bit more of a probabilistic manner. And also that's how I look at, um, generally, how I look at stock prices too. Uh, there's, this very, there's an obvious tendency for everyone to look at stock prices. This is what the price is, and then the stock went up by 2% or down by 5%, and that, and that is the new price. Whereas I generally think of stock prices as just being a kind of probabilistic range, because no one really knows what a company is worth. Um, and so if, if, if the stock price is being traded, it kind of fluctuates within a range of a few percent, then that's just a natural outcome of the fact that no one knows what the stock is worth and it's in there somewhere. Um, rather than like, and so I, I, try, I, you know, I basically think statistically and as a result of that, I generally ignore most um, short-term stock fluctuations. Felix, uh, this is Brianna. We were chatting shortly before you came on the show. You made a really interesting transition when you moved from Reuters to Fusion, and I know there was a lot of reaction um, from your audience, many people who didn't even know what Fusion was. So could you tell us a little bit about your decision to do that and, and what it is that you're doing now? Uh, sure, yeah. I was having um, 
a lot of fun huge uh, writers. Um, I had a blog there. Um, I've been blogging basically full time for about eight years, and I one of the things I wanted to do was get a little bit away from that sort of daily blogging routine and start spending a bit more time um, putting a bit more effort into create in, into telling the stories that I tell in a different way, inventing new ways of explaining things to people and explaining the world to people, um, using more visuals, um, more um, interactive projects, um, and, and basically try and get away from the easy thing to do on the internet. As I say, this, is, this dates back for, to 99, 2000 when I started my blog. The easy thing to do on the internet is to just open up an HTML editor and write some words down and then click publish. And so that's basically what I've been doing up until now and what a lot of other people in the econoblogosphere have been doing. And what I wanted to do is sort of take that to the next level and say, well, how, you know, how would you explain things if you had a team of people who could do interactive projects, who could do video, who could um, you know, have great designers and really put a bunch of effort into telling these stories in a new way for you know, an audience who might only have been in their teens when I started out in the 2000s. And so that's my, that's my new thing at Fusion. Absolutely. That's, that's a really uh, interesting transition. So we've only got a couple of minutes left with you here. So can we just get kind of your idea of what the future of financial media looks like? <laughs> um, I, I really don't know. I hate making predictions about this kind of thing. Um, I think that the people who love to forecast the death of the terminal businesses are deluding themselves. Um, you know, having worked for Thomson, Thomson Reuters, knowing a lot of people who work for Bloomberg, those are really, really magnificent, very large, very well-resourced businesses, and they're not going anywhere. Um, so, and then, you know, I, what, what I look forward to I think the biggest change that I'm looking forward to is, is an increase in the amount of information and reporting and analysis, which has already started, but I think it's going to continue, which comes from professionals rather than from journalists. Because journalists don't really know anything. All we know is stuff which we get from talking to professionals. And I think that increasingly the professionals are doing a pretty good job at disintermediating the journalists and coming out themselves and saying what they think and using the various tools that the different websites and, and um, other information providers are giving them to, to, you know, to just put their stuff out on their own. And I think especially now that we've had the Jobs Act pass in the U.S., um, you know, compliance officers are becoming increasingly comfortable with that kind of activity. And so what I'm looking forward to is the, a lot of the conversations which used to be hidden to the public, um, conversations between journalists and, and professionals or conversations between professionals and professionals will now become surfaced and, and everyone will be able to see what people are talking about. Okay, we've had Felix Salmon on the line. He's senior editor at Fusion and author of the Felix Salmon blog. Thanks for coming on today. We loved your insight, and uh, looking forward to reading your blogs in the future, and hope to have you again on the show. Thank you very much.